The Lord is here. Let's pray. Father, may your word be our rule. And may your Holy Spirit be our teacher. And may your greater glory be our supreme concern. The thing that we're most interested in. And focus on above all. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Do you know the the title for today is Put On The New Self. And uh, these are not my words. These are the Apostle Paul's words. If there's a new self, it means there must be an old self, isn't there? We, we can't have something new unless uh, there was something old in the first place. You've never replaced the coat that, uh, you know, it's, it's your new <coughs> coat, isn't it? But, so whatever it is, um, we refer to a new self here, and Paul does, because he also refers to the old self. It actually doesn't call it the old self, it talks about the former self. And it's one of the things that happens to us, isn't it? As soon as we become believers, we believe and we put it into practice. We, we confess our sins, we come before God and we say, Lord, you were around me every day of my life and I never realised. I just never, I never looked below the surface to see you. I never looked up and I always looked at man and human beings. I listened to their opinions, never yours. I didn't realise that you made, you made all this. I didn't realise you had a standard. And Lord, help me to, to live according to your standard. I trust you now. Uh, and I trust you more. I choose to trust you more than any other human being. Because you are God. And you're perfect. Your motives are true. And so, something new happens to us, doesn't it? The Bible Um, Again, not my words, it talks about, Paul says, you are a new creation, he says. And when something's created, it's it's come from from nothing, in the sense that it's been created. God is a creator, he created the world from nothing. And so, not because we deserved anything inside us, not that there was anything of real merit in it to say, okay, well, I'll, I'll choose Susie to be one of my people, or Margaret. No, not at all. But those that have responded with faith, the Lord calls his own, who confess their sins. So there's a, there's a new self that happens when we come to Christ. Now we know this. And when we speak to other people about our faith, we, we do our best to explain that there is a new creation that happens. The old has gone, the new has come. And when the Apostle Paul writes this letter to the church at Ephesus... He starts, as, as Christine read, he says, I tell you this, and I'm insisting on it, he says, in the Lord. I insist on it, in the Lord. It means there's no buts. You know, there's, no, there's not much leeway. It's not like, you know, your dad saying to you before he goes, look, if you get time or if you, if you feel like it, do this for me when I go. No, it's not like that. Um, it's a, La Father says, look, I insist on this. There's no other way. And... Uh, what does he insist on? He talks first of all about the life that the Gentiles live. And he says, you must no longer live as they do. And now the Gentiles, if you remember, was everybody that was not a Jew. Um, but here he's talking about Gentiles that uh, haven't come to the Lord, whereas many Gentiles did. So he's saying, you know, you, whether you're a Gentile or not in the past, you must no longer live like they do. You know, sometimes the grooves are so deep with the old life that it's hard to get out of the groove. It's almost easier to stay in the groove of an old life with the old patterns, with the old friends, with the family members. We, we're different with, with the family members that don't believe. Um, it's tempting to just go back into, the, into that kind of talk, that kind of way of being, because we're with them. No, no. He says... I insist on it, he says. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do. And he goes on to describe what's happened to people. And he's also describing us before we came to the Lord. What happens to people to cause them not to have any spiritual sight of the Lord? But they don't see the Lord. And he says in verse 17, he says, Their, their thinking is futile. 
Um, futile means it, it's not going anywhere. Um, it's a bit like somebody saying to you, look, don't bother doing that, it's futile. In other words, it's not going to get you anywhere. He says here that the, the Gentiles' thinking is, is futile. It doesn't really get them anywhere. And he says that they are darkened in their understanding. Their thinking, the way they think, the way we used to think, means that our, our understanding is darkened. Now, darkened basically means we, there's not enough light to see and have good understanding. There, there is some understanding, but it's a darkened understanding. It, it's limited light. And that's verse 18. And he says, they're separated from the life of God. And, and so, why are they separated from the life of God? He goes on to say, because of the ignorance that's in them, and used to be in us, by the way. The ignorance that's in them, and used to be in us. Why? Due to the hardening of their hearts. So, I think when we're in that groove of the old life, um, we sometimes uh, have this sense of, well, look, I, I think I'm okay. I'm not mur- I've not murdered anybody. I've, let it, I've not stolen from anybody. Um, I'm not a bad person. And we justify staying in the old groove and keeping many of the ways of the world. And we think, you know what? I'm, I'm better than so-and-so at least. I'm better than she is. At least, at least I'm not doing what so-and-so does. But what happens is there's a hardening of the heart. And it means that it was separated from the life of God because we're not, we've lost our sensitivity. The heart isn't sensitive enough to hear God's voice, which the Bible says is a still, small voice. We just can't hear it. The, the heart is hard. And many of us know that famous passage where the Lord says, give me your heart of stone. The Lord can do something about it. He says, give me your heart of stone. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll, I'll give you what you haven't got. I'll give you a heart that feels something. I'll give you a heart that sees spiritual things, not just what's here and now and of the world. And then he goes on to say, he says, um, having lost all sensitivity, if the heart's not sensitive, having lost all sensitivity to hear God's voice, he says they've given themselves over to sensuality. And sensuality... Um, can mean of, of sexual immorality, of course, sensuality, but it can mean anything that's sensual, anything that's uh, that we that, that we think is a uh, you know a luxury, if you like, um, a, de- a decadence. And the Lord's not saying don't enjoy good things. Of course, He's not, but in their right frame framework. So, for sexual immorality, it's within a marriage between a man and a woman, for example. Um, But he he says they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. So once the door's opened into uh, losing our sensitivity and going down the wrong path, it opens up to every kind of impurity. There isn't any restraint anymore because the heart is hardened. The understanding is darkened. There's been a loss of sensitivity. There's a futility of the thinking. So you just see what, what you think you see. You think that's all there is. And then it says, with a continual lust for more. And again, a, a, a lust for more doesn't necessarily, it's not just just limited to sexual immorality. A lust for more is just doing the wrong things. Once you start doing the wrong things, which could be any, all sorts of things, it, it's very hard to get out of that groove. And many of these things then become almost addictive. So it's even harder then to come out. It's um, it's almost like losing all sense of shame. Um, they don't feel it anymore. And before we became believers, we came to Christ, some of us, many of us, if you can remember that, there was that sense in which you didn't feel that something was necessarily wrong. Yes, we had a conscience, but there became lots of grey areas, if you remember, we thought, well, that's okay, might be wrong, but I'm not sure if it really is. What if We started to look for things that allowed us to, to do what we wanted to do and, and justify it. And what happens is even that conscience that we used to have that told us that something was wrong, that conscience we, it, it's gone. It's, it's not very clear anymore. It's become very fuzzy. 
because the heart has been has become hardened. And he's saying that you don't that, that's not how you came to know Christ. It wasn't by doing those things, it wasn't by mixing with that kind of company that you came to know Christ. He says that's that's not he wasn't on that road. You were on a different road. He was over here. That's not how you came to know him. And he says, Surely, says, you heard of him, and you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. And he mentioned, he says again, he says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. So, he says here, um, you did not come to know Christ that way. You didn't learn about Christ that way. And then he says, you were taught in him. And then he says, you were taught with regard to... So three times he talks about learning and, and being taught. And you know, when some people say, well, I believe in God, but they've never been taught. And I'm not talking about necessarily somebody like myself, or it, it could be teach themselves to read their scriptures, to expose themselves to God's word, to talk to somebody who knows the Lord. So many of them haven't learned that. They've not been taught. And the scripture here, and Paul's reminding us, we need to be taught Otherwise, how do we know? How do we know right from wrong? You know, we, we, again, we have the conscience. We come to know the Lord. But we need to do something once we come to know the Lord. And Paul is saying, I'm telling you this, he says at the beginning, and I'm insisting on it in the Lord. There's no ifs or buts. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self. It actually does say the old self. I thought it was a former self. So... Here's Paul talking about the old self and the new self. He's saying, look, we know there was an old self. And don't we know there was an old self of one of us? A, a, a version of us that was the old self. And he says, to put off your old self. Well, how can you put off your old self? Have we got the power to do that? Doesn't God do that? It's a good question, isn't it? But I want to say to you this morning, brothers and sisters, that we have a part to play. So the Lord makes us new. We're a new creation. But then we have to put off the old self and put on the new. What's the difference? The difference is God gives us the power to do it. There's no point telling someone to put off the old self if they haven't got power to do it. That would be cruel, wouldn't it? It wouldn't, doesn't work. It's, it's making somebody feel like, well, I'm trying and I can't. But for a believer who has the Holy Spirit inside them, every single one of you, and myself included, the Lord's given us the power In one of the previous, uh, you know, uh, Sunday mornings, we talked about, from scripture, we talked about to put to death the misdeeds of the body. In other words, how can you put to death? You have to have the power to do that. The Lord gives us the power. The Lord is not asking us to do something here. And Paul is not asking us to do something here that we're not capable of doing. For him to ask us and actually say, I'm insisting on it, it means it's within our wherewithal to do it. It's within our power to do it. In Christ, by the Holy Spirit. And it says here, the old self is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Well, you know, uh, sometimes for those of you that have ever been on a computer, and I know many of you don't like computers, I understand that. But sometimes you end up with um, corrupt file. Have you ever come across that? The file is corrupted, even the hard drive is corrupted. That's even worse, because you lost everything. But you know, it's the beginning of the end. If something's been corrupted, it's... It's past its sell-by date. And here, you know, if you, um, you know, we have food that's, that's okay by a certain date, then it goes off. And in that sense, you, we, don't use, we don't normally refer to it as corrupted food, but it, the food's been corrupted. It's not fit for purpose anymore. And Paul is saying, look, the old life is not fit for purpose anymore. It's the new self that's come. Put off the old self. And it's, he says it's been corrupted by its deceitful desires. We've already seen some of those. Where we, we get into a groove and we want more of, of the old thing. Because we're familiar with it. Rather than trusting God to put the old self behind. To trust him for the new life. And he's saying there's so much better that I have for you than that. And you know some people are capable, we all are of trying to carry some of this stuff from the old life uh, into the new life, thinking, well, if I, could have, if I could have the best of over here, and maybe if I could bring it over here, then I can see some good things over here. 
the old theologians or even current theologians call it syncretism. But it's that sense in which we're trying to live and it doesn't work. You're trying to live with one foot over here and one foot over here. And Paul is encouraging, because they're believers he's writing to, he's encouraging them, look, bring both feet over. Leave, leave, leave the stuff there. What I'm going to give you is so much more. And what you're bringing over or trying to hold on to is actually going to take up the space and the place of the new things that I'm giving you by my spirit. And he said to be made new in the attitude of your minds. And if our attitude of our minds changes, then it it directs the rest of our body, doesn't it? Because this is where the, the control operations room is. So if the attitude of our minds changes, it says, and it says, put on the new self. We can do that. But we do that by faith. Because we believe in the Lord. And we believe that by his Holy Spirit, we can put on the new self. Now, we will have resistance. We've talked about this many times. We have an enemy. And we pray the prayer that the Lord taught the disciples. We talk about deliver us from the evil one. We, we have opposition. Lead us not into temptation. And so, that new self that you have, by right, by, because if God's given it to you, it's yours by right, because he's given it to you. That new self, which is we are a new creation, where you're an adopted son and daughter of the Most High God. That's, it gives us the right, he says, to be called children of God. This is scripture words. He gave us the right to. But the enemy will try and take that from you from time to time. At weak moments, it's like, are you? Are you an adopted daughter? We, you're not thinking like one. You're not behaving like one. You've not spoken like one. And the enemy will attempt to get you to forfeit that identity of the new self. So that you slip back and maybe think, you know what? Maybe I'm still in the old life anyway. I'll go back to that. What a mistake. Paul says, no, w- watch out for this. He says, I insist on it. Don't live as the Gentiles do. Because your thinking isn't, isn't uh, futile anymore. Not in the Lord. Your understanding isn't darkened anymore. Not like the Gentiles. It's been enlightened. You're not ignorant anymore. You know more. You know better. So the Lord is calling you back. We may make mistakes as children of God. We may make, well, of course we're going to make mistakes. Praise God that maybe then we can minimise those. If we stay close to him, we will minimise them when we stay close to him. But when we make them, God is gracious to forgive us. We still stay a daughter of the God, of Most High God. We still stay a son of God, adopted son of God. We don't lose the identity, but the enemy would like us to forfeit that as if it was never there. And he says we were created, it says in verse 24, to be like God. You think, well, hang on a minute, Chris. <laughs> Isn't that blasphemy? Like, oh, this is not my words. The Apostle Paul's. How? It doesn't mean like God in the sense that we're seated in heaven and we, uh, we're sovereign above all. It doesn't mean that. He says, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We need to reflect in who we are, our Heavenly Father. That, that's who he is. He's, he's true righteousness and holiness. But we need to reflect our Heavenly Father. You know, just like um, I hope, you know, Abraham's here this morning. I hope his children are a credit to him. And he thinks, you know what, I, I'm pleased to say they reflect me. Some of the attitude, some of the standards, some of the values. You know, with Josephine thinking, you know, yeah, I can see that they reflect. That, that We need to reflect some of the character of the Lord, some of the, uh, the it says that in true righteousness and holiness. Now, righteousness of our own? No. It says in Christ. We change. So then he goes on to talk about, uh, therefore each of you says, must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbour. You know, it's, uh, lying is one of those things that, um, when they've carried out surveys out on the street, you can see them on YouTube, some of them on programmes, and they say, have you ever lied? And I don't, I don't think anyone has ever said, no, I've never lied. Um, people have said, I, I, I try not to, or maybe a white lie, you know. But no one says no. It's um, he, he's not talking here. Now, for some of us, if we were to say, "Look, so and so is a liar," 
we would expect them to not have any, any truth coming out of their mouth at all. That's not what he's saying. He says, you know, sometimes we, uh, especially in the old life, get into the habit where it's just easy to sell a white lie and just not tell the truth. And he says, put it off. It's part, it's part of the old self. L- leave it, leave it behind. And speak truthfully, he says, to his neighbour. He says, we're all members of one body. Now you think, did he really have to say this to believers? Put off falsehood? Well, he obviously did. You know, we're not perfect in the church. You know, and uh, when people point the finger at at the church and say, look, people are hypocrites, etc. Well, there's some element of truth. Some people, you know, will slip and live hypocritically. But he says, don't do it. And he's saying, don't do it. He doesn't say, try not to do it. He says, don't do it because we've got the power not to. He'll help us. But you know, the Lord, have you ever tried helping somebody no matter what help you've given them? You, you've been there for them. You've tried to help them in every way you can. No matter what you do, they don't seem to help themselves at all. Yeah, have you experienced this? Well, the Lord will help us. But he helps those who help themselves. And he's saying that you have something to do. He, he, the door is opened. We've become a new creation. The new self has come. And he's saying, follow, follow it through. Follow it through from the old self into the new self. Follow it through. And make me proud. He loves us anyway, even when we fail. But what we don't want him to say is, I'll be ashamed of you when the day comes. We, we don't want that. And then he says, in your anger, do not sin. Now, some of you might say, well, hang on a minute. If somebody's angry, aren't they sinning already? In your anger, do not sin. Is it possible to be angry and not sin? Well, the answer is yes. We can be angry, but we can not sin. What does that look like? Well, you can be angry at an injustice that's going on, something that you've heard somebody's just experienced or somebody's doing. But if that anger turns, for example, into hating someone, then hating is a sin. If that anger means that you say some choice words, which are not very good, then that's moved into sin. That anger's moved into sin. Um, so if you're, if you're angry with someone to the point that you, you hate them, the Bible, Jesus equated hatred with murder, that's clearly a sin. But then it goes on to say, so there's a way of actually you know, expressing how you feel in a loving way to somebody. And you might be angry. Somebody could see that you're angry. But it says, don't sin during it. There's such a thing as a righteous anger. And then it says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. You know, it's advice that's given um, often at marriage services to couples. Um, because couples are with each other so often for so much time. And there's bound to be... Uh, Times when, you know, uh, words are said. It's part, of, it's part of resolving things. You can't have a, a relationship where there isn't any, any conflict at all. Otherwise, you've, you've not resolved anything. But if you're angry and the sun's going down and you're about to go to bed. But it's not just for couples. It's, it might be a brother, a sister. It might be a parent. It might be a good friend. It might be someone. And... It says, don't, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. So it does mean doing something about it. Saying something like, look, I know we haven't resolved this. Uh, but I, <laughs> I don't want to go to bed angry. So I forgive you, we need to talk to, can we talk tomorrow? Can we make a time? But to do something and not leave it. Because what comes next, he says, and do not give the devil a foothold. Because it's the kind of thing where the enemy enjoys coming in. Because you're angry. And in your anger, in your anger, he, he'd, he'd very much like you to sin. He'd very much like you to develop maybe a bitter root inside you. How's that going to help anyone? Is it going to help you as a believer or me or the church or the people you serve or the people around you? Is that attractive in any way? Is it godly? Or are we back to living as the Gentiles do? 
So the enemy is looking for opportunities. The Bible says he's like a, a roaring lion, prowling. He looks for opportunities, and that would be one. And Paul is saying, I tell you this and I insist on it, don't do that. And he talks about, he says, he who's been stealing mustn't steal anymore. Now, you might think that's obvious. But, you know, sometimes old habits uh, die hard. We, um, uh, you know, I knew uh, one person who uh, had come to the Lord many, many years ago. And uh, I couldn't believe that many, many years later, he still thought it was fine to, uh, to duplicate, excuse me, duplicate CDs and DVDs and sell them. He used to sell them for a pound. Sorry, I'm not giving any ideas to anyone, by the way. <laughs> but he used to go to the church, sell them for a pound. Which, which album do you want? And he had to be confronted over this. In, in love. I call him Robert. Robert, what are you doing? This isn't... You know, in that sense, it's a form of stealing. What I'm saying is, sometimes we can have blind spots. We do things, and we think, you know what, that, that isn't right. <coughs> and we, we do need to call each other out on this, because we love each other. As brothers and sisters. It doesn't need to be the pastor, does it? If one of you sees each other, you're brother and sister. So we're together. We need to say, look, um, we need to just cut it out. It, it's quite straightforward. Don't, don't try and stop doing that. Just stop doing it. And he says that those stop stealing must steal no longer, he says. But he says, but must work. It must work. Doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. And it basically, it's come up many times with Paulie when he was writing to the Thessalonians. He says, uh, 2 Thessalonians verse 10, he says, the one who's unwilling, unwilling to work, shall not eat. It's quite stark. Now we've got out of the habit of that in many of our you know, Western cultures, but that's the principle of a believer, someone who loves the Lord and follows Christ. It's not optional to work. If you can. And why? Well, it gives a few reasons, apart from the obvious. You're not relying on others who are working when you can. And it says also you have something to share with others. So in other words, he's saying that you can help others, not just yourself, you know, if you're working. Now... We come to uh, conversation and talk. And Paul goes on to say, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Now, um, it's one of those things that we're not going to go into deep today, but the, the Bible has an awful lot to say about what the, our words that we use. But I'll just mention a couple of them. One of them is, it says, consider, says uh, the, the Apostle, he says, what... What, what a forest being set alight by a spark and the tongue can cause a fire that becomes very very difficult to put out it's not impossible but it becomes a lot more work to try and put something out once it's started and taken root and starts to spread and of God's people he says I tell you this and I'm insisting on it in the Lord don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, he says. Now, for him to say don't let it, it means that we've got a choice whether we let it or not. Now, sometimes we lose control, of course. We're human beings and we, maybe we're not close to the Lord in that moment. Maybe we've just let things get on top of us. There's such a word as hangry. Have you heard that? Somebody who's angry because they're hungry. Hangry. But you know, sometimes it's, it's the wrong moment to have that conversation. And you think, I'm not going to say something useful here. I need to delay it and just think about it a bit more. I might need to write something down. I might need to read over what I've written down before I speak. He says, but only let talk come out of your mouths, he says, that is helpful for building others up according to their needs. And you know what? If you think about the number of words that we speak a day, and I speak many words a day, and, you know, somebody like myself who speaks many words a day, the Bible says to be wary 
because he says, where words are many, sin is not absent. That's a scripture. So we need to be aware of that. At the same time, if the Lord is, if the Lord has called you to, to speak and to encourage, etc., and to use, if the Lord's called you to use these many words, you just need to make sure, you're doubly sure. And the Bible says anyone who's teaching is going to be judged far more strictly than somebody who doesn't teach. So I'm, I'm aware of that for myself. But we all need to be aware of our words. It can cause a fire. But it can also be a balm. It can also be a balm on a difficult situation. We can be peacemakers with a word. We can encourage somebody the right way. We can say, look, lay it down. Overlook it. We can encourage them. But sometimes in the church, unfortunately, some people feel the need to get on this side or that side. And what does that do? just keeps the fire going. It just causes damage to the fellowship. And he says, use the words for building up. If you've got many words, use them. Build people up. Encourage them. It doesn't have to be negative. But don't let the unwholesome talk. And we, you know, sometimes we feel convicted when the unwholesome talk comes out. It may be that we work in a certain place where the language is not, it's not what we'd like it to be. You don't control that. I don't control that. Who does? People need to live their lives and make their decisions. And if they want to use that language. But it's easy to catch some of that, some of it. Some of the tone, which is a bit harsher, a bit industrial. And for it to, to come home, and we just sometimes need to do a, a you know, deep cleanse and say, Lord, sometimes we need to go to the loo when we're on our own and say, Lord, difficult conversation in the office right now. I need you to help me here. I need you to help me so I don't speak out of turn. So it's important that we only allow those words which are helpful, which build up and are beneficial. And then he says that, um, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now, you know, when we do let unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, it, we do grieve the Lord, the Holy Spirit. It, it grieves. Where does the Holy Spirit live? Inside you. Inside me. He's not far. So when we're speaking unwholesome words, where do we think the Lord is? It, it grieves the Holy Spirit. You know, at times when the children were growing up, if I was a bit harsh the day before because I was tired and whatever excuse it was, I was bit, if I was too harsh and I, I lay in bed and I realised that I was a bit harsh, sometimes I used to text, I'd send a text, I was texting, there were no WhatsApps, i send a text and say, Theo, I'm sorry I was a bit harsh with you last night. And he was so gracious, he'd say, Dad, don't worry about it, it's fine. You know? Some things are useful. Some words are not. We just need to own it and, and move on. And the Holy Spirit of God, which is grieved, we've heard before in Ephesians 1, um, a few weeks back before Christmas, is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. And here it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We're going to be redeemed. But we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's a reminder of who we belong to. Right here. It, it, it's, it's so near. So, Paul is saying, I tell you this, and I'm insisting on it in the Lord. Don't do that. That was, that was the old life. That was the old self. This is the new self. And then he says... Get rid of all bitterness. You know, um, I've referred to a bitter root. The Bible talks about a bitter root. You know, if you let a root grow, it, it, it is hard to dislodge. I know I'm looking around and some of you are no king gardeners, but it's, it's, it's a tough thing to dislodge, isn't it? A root that's really t allowed. It's best to catch it so we can get it out easily. It, it, knows, it, it, might, take you, it might take you a minute or two to get out a root that's only gone that far. But you let something grow. You're going to be out there for a while. Trying to deal with it. It causes damage. It, um, we, we know a root can knock down a wall. Some, some houses can't be mortgaged. Because of the roots. That may have gone under the foundation. That's what can happen. He says don't do that. He says get rid of all bitterness. Just drop it he says. You know when he says. You know get rid. 
you know, it's not much different to our expression of get rid. You know, we say, look, we don't need that. Do we need that? No, get rid. It means, means throw it out in the bucket. There's no ifs or buts. It's not like, mm, I'm not sure. We could be useful in the future. Maybe we might use it. Or No. It says get rid. Or bitterness. Rage. What's the difference with rage? Well, rage is, is an intense, uncontrolled anger. That's the definition of rage. Well, we know one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. So if we're out of control, we're outside the will of God. Because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know what you're going to say next. So don't trust yourself to do that. So there isn't any room for rage. Anger and do not sin is a different matter. But rage, which is uncontrolled anger, which could go anywhere. It could cause huge damage, like a wrecking ball. And he says, get rid of it. And, you know, uh, the people with anger issues, of course, that you might meet in prayer more than once. With people that love you, you can trust, not going to judge you or condemn you. But we can get rid of rage. Because the Bible says we can, and the Apostle Paul is saying the same thing here. Get rid of brawling, he says. Brawling is, is fighting. Now, fighting can be not just physical. Fighting with words. You know, a slanging match is a brawl. And you feel bruised afterwards. He says it's not our way. It's not the new self. It's the old self. Get rid of it, he says. Put it behind. And slander. Now, again, you wouldn't think that Christians would actually get involved in actually slandering anyone. What does slander mean? Slander means saying something about someone that's not true. And you know it's not true. Or repeating something about someone that you haven't first said, someone else has said it, but you repeat it. It's still slander. And he says, get rid of slander. And then he says, along, along with all of those, he says, get rid of every form of malice. Now, malice is is ill will. It's not wishing good for someone. Anything in your heart that doesn't wish good for someone, get rid of every sort of malice. Because it's taking up space here that the Lord wants to come in and use you and every part of you for his purposes. The Bible says noble purposes. And as we come to the end here, He finishes the chapter by saying, be kind and compassionate to one another. You know, it's, he's talking to believers now, be kind and compassionate to one another. Uh, I mentioned last week about, I think, it was, I think it was last week, about Alan. Every time I, he sings the song, everyone needs compassion, I think of him. He, he, he personifies that for me. We need to be com- com- compassionate to one another, but if we're, for people that are not, have got into the habit of not coming to church, not being part of the body, there's no one another. And it kind of lets us off the hook a little bit. And it's not God's way. Listen to this. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other. But if there's no each other around, how can we exercise this? Do you know what I mean? Being part of the fellowship of, of, of your local church, for any, for any Christian, is the way we calibrate each other. We have an opportunity to forgive each other. And if we're not, it becomes obvious. We have an opportunity to be kind and compassionate to each other. And if we're not, because we see each other, it becomes obvious. When we're not at church and we give up meeting together, as, as, it says, it says, as some people are in the habit of doing, said the Apostle Paul, he says, we don't have that opportunity of the one another and each other, have we? So, how do we how do we make sure that we are living the new self? This is the last part of our today. How do we make sure that we're living the new self? The Bible says you do it. The Apostle Paul is saying do it. It means you can because the Holy Spirit. Well, that's all true. But I'm going to give you another clue here. Uh, a clue that for all of us as believers. David, King David says in Psalm 51... He says, create in me a pure heart. And he says, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. This is back to grieving the Holy Spirit. And then he gives us the answer of how. He says, I've hidden, I've hidden 
Another version says, I've stored. Another version says, I treasure. I've hidden your word, he says, in my heart. So that I might not sin against you. We need to be taught. We need to put ourselves in a position to learn. And then we need to store God's word in our hearts. So that we might not sin against him and grieve the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful life. But we have our part to play. The Lord has called us to himself. And we want to reflect him in the situations that we live in. Evangelism doesn't, it's not just words, we know that. But you know what? If we're living the new self and we put on the new self, you'll find we'll all find our words carry so much more weight. So let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you, Lord, that we have our part to play. Show us the part that we do need to play. Lord, help us to make sure we, we know your word so that we might not sin against you. Help us to treasure it, to store it, so that we know what it is that you require of us, a life that's pleasing to you. Help us, Lord, to live a life worthy of the calling that we have. Lord, help us to leave the old life behind, the old self. Lord, help us not to be tempted to carry baggage or old ways from the old self into the new self. But to leave space for you to transform us. That we may have all the fruits of the Spirit. A life of peace, a life of joy, of gentleness, of brotherly love, of goodness, of self-control, of kindness. Lord, this is what you've called us to. Lord, I pray that you'll help us by your spirit and by our own actions to receive this and to appropriate it more and more. Especially in this coming year, Lord, of 2024. Thank you, Lord, that you give us direction. In Jesus' name, amen.